What's going on YouTube? My name's Stu Roberts. I'm founder of Trial Talk Plasterers Help Group on Facebook. In this video today, we're going to talk about set sizes. How many bags of plaster should you be throwing on per day? Now, there's a number of contributing factors that is going to affect how much plaster you decide to throw on per day. And today in this video, I've got six contributing factors for you and I'm hoping that this information is going to help you determine how much plaster you should be throwing on per day. Now as you know on the forums even on trial talk sometimes you do get a little bit of willy waving going on so I'll tell you a quick story about 10 years ago when I joined some of the plastering forums and one of the opening questions to me were, was Welcome to the group. How many bags of plaster can you put on a day? And I thought, why is that important? I was answered, well, unless you can put, you know, 10 plus bags on per day, then you're not a real plasterer and you shouldn't be on this forum. So it got me thinking, you know, firstly, I thought, what have I entered into here? Secondly, I thought, am I back in the playground? You know, I bet my dad can beat up your dad. So exited from that group, joined a few of us, but generally speaking, there is a bit of a, a thing that goes on with us blokes on these forums. And it's the competition of how many bags can you throw on a day? I think where this mentality comes from would be the meterage. So if you're in a situation where you're paid by the meter, where the person you're working for is dictating to you how much they'll pay you per meter, naturally you're going to be inclined to smash on the meters so that you can put bread on the table on a friday night now i would advise you to steer clear of that way of working i would advise you to build up your own name your own reputation your own customers do your own marketing and move away and avoid working to the meter and the reason being is we see a lot of posts on trial talk guys that are injured older guys because you won't feel this in your 20s you won't probably won't feel it in your 30s older guys late 30s early 40s and older that are either starting to get or have got chronic plastering injuries including wrist issues carpal tunnel um, rotor cuff injuries i'm talking chronic pain and they might have um, tennis elbow severe tennis elbow where to the point where they're having cortisone injected into, into their elbows um, operations are happening and you know even pins being put in and whatnot it's quite heartbreaking to see these journeymen these um, seasoned plasterers that have dedicated their whole careers to plastering um, only to become 45 50 and wrecked I'm not saying that um, this is inevitable because it's not inevitable guys um, but it is likely to happen if you're working to the meter and you are being encouraged to smash out vast quantities. You know what it's like, repetitive strain injury, that constant, um, you know, troweling, 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 especially if it's heavy material, um, it's going to lead to injury. So I wanted to demonstrate to you and I wanted to give you and you guys an insight to what I put on per day when I'm working on my own. And you might be surprised. Some of you might think you're a lazy bastard, which is fair enough if that's your um, viewpoint. Some of you might be surprised to think, to be fair, that's more than what I would put on. So here's a bucket that I've owned for about 16 years. This is a refiner, two bag bucket guys. Okay, two bag bucket. And typically, depending on the job, depending on what I'm doing, typically my max will be two of these maximum two of these guys and the reason being is i don't want to be here till five six seven o'clock at night um i want a lunch break and i don't want to be working like a dog okay so i'll work in a way that's sustainable for me and that means i can be home at the door for our three four o'clock okay so i've got a two bag bucket i won't mix up more than two of these if i'm skimming all right obviously if i'm doing floating sets it's a different story but i'm talking uh, over skimming okay or skimming onto fresh board so two bag bucket um if i'm working with matt we'll we'll use a free bag and we'll go to the brim with it 
de again, depending on uh, how much we've got. But I want to talk to you about um, these factors that will determine how much plaster you, you should be putting on. Let's say that you've done your time at college, you've done five years on the tools, you've done five years on the trial, working in a gang or working under an experienced journeyman. So your speed is pretty much there. We'll assume that your speed's there. But if it isn't there and you're still learning and you're still picking up your speed and you're still trying to get that confidence, then the amount you put on a day should be absolutely irrelevant. It shouldn't matter because you're still learning, you're still fine tuning your craft. You're still trying to close in that final trial and get all them little imperfections out um, and get all your edges mint and every, your beading mint. And that's what you should be focused on. You should be focusing on the finish, the quality and the cleanliness of your work. So the speed and how much you should throw on a day Forget about that, it's not important. You need to be focusing on the quality of your work. So if that means you're doing a one, a one square meter patch and you have to keep doing that until you get competent, then that's that's the case. Until you become competent, then you move on to a, a bigger area, okay? so But let's suppose that you are experienced, as I say. So you've got them five years under your belt. You've worked under somebody that is that was good. And that's shown you the correct way. And now your speed's up and you, you know what you're doing. Five other determining factors that you're going to have to take into account when you're mixing up and when you're doing these domestic jobs. So the first thing is suction. Now, on this particular job, I'm working in a 1930s semi. And these walls suck like mad. Now, I've applied a mix of PVA and SBR. Okay, and that's had two passes but the walls were still pulling in because they're old and they're dry and they're just pulling that moisture out of the skim coat guys. So suction plays a huge part and it will determine how much you mix up, especially if you're working on your own, it's going to determine how much you mix up and how much you lob on. So take that into account. Don't just think to yourself, oh, you know, I've got a, a huge big flat area. I can get all this on on my own because before you do that, you've got to test out that suction and make sure that you're not going to get tripped up halfway through your set. Suction is really, really, really important. Now, obviously, the more high suction the walls are, the less you're going to knock up. Now, the next thing is humidity. Have you ever been caught out on the job where the customer's left the heating on? Um, have you ever been caught out where the sun is beaming through the bay window and pulling the life out of your skin? We all have. I have. So that's another factor that you've got to take into account when you're knocking up. If you've got high humidity, means that you've got to lower them sets down, shrink them sets down, and um, don't mix up too much because you'll get halfway through your set and the life will be pulled out of your skin and it'll be drying out before you can even finish getting it on the wall. You'll be chasing your tail. So that's humidity. Next one, draft. Have you ever been in a situation where there's no windows on the site? That wind is, again, it's pulling the life out of your skin. It's pulling all the moisture out of your skin. And if you're throwing too much on, the chances are you're gonna lose control of that set. So if you've got drafty property, you're gonna to have to shrink the sets down to get over the fact that your cluster's going off really, really, really fast. Access. Now I'm talking about access because, and I'll show you in a minute, I've had a situation on the stairs here yesterday afternoon where I couldn't reach. So I've had to plank out, set some ladders up. And because I've got stuff down here to throw on and some stuff on the landing, I mean, we know the hall stairs and landing is the arsehole of the house. We, we all hate doing the hall stairs and landing, but it has to be done. And when, to be fair, when we, when we finish it, we're always happy and it always looks, looks the part. And it has to look the part because it's the presentation, it's the entrance to the home. So, but they're an absolute pig. I know some plasters they don't even do all stairs and landing because they hate they hate them that much. Anyway, I'm up here. I've got a plank set up, and every time I have to come down the stairs, I'm moving that plank, I'm moving them ladders, and I'm up and down like a yo-yo, back down underneath, and then back up again. So, access is really important. That's a bottleneck on the job that's going to slow you down quite a lot so if you've knocked up too much gear um, that's going to be going off in the tub while you're goofing around moving your planks moving your ladders up and down the stairs and the last one guys 
is detailing. Now, I'm gonna run you through what I did here, which has got a couple of bull noses um, and a curved section under the stairs here. I'll flip the camera around and show you this in a minute, but when I'm talking detailing, I'm talking about those little intricate bits in the house, whether it's a curve, whether it's a barreled ceiling, a curvature at the top of the ceiling. It could be um, a bay window with funny little, you know, reveals, or it could be, um, it could be a situation where you've got heavy bead work. So you might have fucking 20 beads, loads of little nibs and reveals to do. Now, as you know, that is gonna be a massive bottleneck on your set. So if you've got a three bag set knocked up going off in the tub and you're spending, you know, 15 minutes filling out all your beads and trying to mess around, get everything cut in really nice, that gear is now going off in the tub. So detailing is another one to consider when you're knocking up your gear. I hope that's given you a good insight into the things that affect how much plaster you should knock up per day. The mark of a good plasterer isn't how much you can throw on per day, okay? The mark of a good spread is the quality of the finish. Of course we need speed, of course we need efficiency, of course we need to be competent at what we're doing, but it can't be about how many bags can you lob on a day. It's like a Neanderthal attitude towards the trade and oftentimes the people that are throwing their bollocks around bragging saying that they can throw on all this plaster per day tend to be the guys that are broke destitute and also haven't got any work so take it with a pinch of salt don't be put off when you see posts by dickheads saying that they throw on 20 bags a day 30 bags a day you know and then do a job on their way home and all this and they don't spill any plaster on the floor it's all bollocks okay work to your own pace work to your own speed and until you're experienced focus on quality not quantity i'm going to flip you around and i'm going to show you how much i've just thrown on to give you an insight as to how much i put on a day and i've been at this 20 years let's spin you around okay guys so before i wrap up this video i'm going to give you a quick tour of what i've just chucked on now again working on my own and as you can see here, I've had to form this curve, which we got asked to do by the customer, okay? Um, I had a little bit of detail in here with a stop bead, which runs up here to create a curve section, okay? Um, and I've got a little bit of fiddly stuff around the door, so the um, margin trials have come out for that. Not too bad. Artex ceiling as well. A little bit of ceiling here, and a big wall, which I say was high suction. So um, the ceiling uh, the ceiling height, as you know, this is the job that we did last week. So I think it was a 2.8, um, I think. Um, so it's a high ceiling. So because it's a high ceiling and I can't reach the top, that's also gonna slow you down considerably. So I've been using um, tall steps to do this one, guys. So all I've put on, okay, today, and it's always two coats guys okay two fresh coats is this big wall here which spans the whole length of the hallway down this section this ceiling section which i've just built out of some bonding to create a curve and i've swept it down ended it here and then worked this bit a little bit around the door and that, that's me done, guys. That's my set, okay? Now, I could get two sets on. Now, sometimes we do do two sets per day, but typically, if we're prepping, in other words, if we've got a scrape back, um, tape up, glue up, take off, um, you know, light switches, power points, sometimes even radiators, and just generally goof around before we can start mixing up, if we have to do any of that, it's normally prep and set, what I call prep and set. So we'll prep, then we'll do a set. We won't be doing prep and two sets. So just to give you an insight there, I'll typically work from around half eight to half three. Um, now, going back some years, I'll be on site for quarter to eight or eight, and I'll be flat out till six. And I did that all through my twenties, and I got fed up of it because after work, 
I'll be running around quoting. Then I'll be crunching the quotes and, and emailing them off and sometimes even typing them up and sending them off. And I got fucking fed up of it. And now I don't work like that. I work to my terms and I work to my hours. So again, some people might be watching this thinking, oh, you know, you're a part-timer, which I've heard before. If you want to work like a dog um, and you want to work like that, that's, that's your choice. But it's not how I work anymore, guys. So again, it'll be a two-bag bucket. Um, two of them, absolute maximum. Now up here, I told you that I had a bit of a, a bottleneck because I couldn't reach that wall here yesterday. So I had to set up a plank which spanned across here so that I could reach up here. Okay, so that really slowed me down. Now on top of that, there was a bull nose feature here. You see this um, nice bull nose that I've created. Now that these ball noses are a massive bottleneck on your jobs okay because um you can't you know if that was beaded you work down to the bead job done but as you know when you've got a ball nose like this that sort of size um it's easy to to get that wrong and as you're trowling you tend to to drag it back off the curve so it takes a bit of time and um, it all takes time and that's something that slowed me down and another reason why I only mixed up enough to get two walls on up here. Um, focusing on this curve, because that's a detailing, what I talked about last, which slowed me down. So I have this detailing to do. And I also put on this ceiling here, which ran in. So I've got the ceiling on, um, focused on this curve, which is an important feature. And this wall here, and then another wall there. Um, and again, today, this big wall, bit of beading up to do, bit of prep, this ceiling. Focusing on this bit of detailing, guys, on the curve, working down to the bottom, and then just this funny little nib around the door. Hope that's given you guys a bit of an insight into what you should be tackling per day. And Again, it might surprise you to think, you know, Stu's been at this 20 odd years and he doesn't seem to be throwing on big, huge sets, yet he's still busy and doing okay. So just keep that in mind, okay? It's not about speed, it's not about meterage, um, it's not about quantity, okay? It's about quality of finish. You do have to be competent at what you're doing and efficient, but it's not about throwing on them meters. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you next